we're just going to kind of go over the video that they published, just reviewing it, kind of how it works. And I have a six question kind of quiz for you guys, just, just to prove that you can turn pages and find stuff in here. So I only do have three. I stole them out of the rig, so if the rig goes on a call, don't forget here. Okay, bye. Damien. There's a so, staff you can get. Damien. Talk over there, please. So, get on your spot. I'm going to play the video. Um, Evan does have a little spiel about um, exposure plan. If you are exposed, what he wants to do, kind of what we're going to do. So, uh, after this, I'll give you guys a test. Please share. You can do it in groups. I don't care. If you want to do it individually, that's cool. So, short video, short quiz. Evan's got a short talk, and then we'll get you out of here. Except for CPR instructors. Except the CPR instructors, I'd like to talk to you about availability and stuff like that. Um, next month is going to be medi medication administration, so that one might run a little longer, just to let everybody know. All right. And what is that, the next, is that the second Tuesday still? Yep. Monday. I believe it's second Monday. Monday. I'm sorry. Eighth. Monday. You got me. Eighth? Eighth. Yep. Yes. So. materials are packaged and transported by tank trucks, rail cars, aircraft, and container vessels. There's over 2.5 million miles of gas and liquid pipeline that wind through our metropolitan urban and rural settings. According to the U.S. Department of Transportation, every year more than 2.5 billion tons of hazmat shipments, including explosive, poisonous, corrosive, flammable, and radioactive materials travel through densely populated areas of our nation and through your jurisdictions. Most shipments arrive at their final destination safely and without incident. But incidents will occur, and the time and place will be as unknown to you as will the type of transport vehicle involved and the properties of the hazardous material it will be transporting. Your safe and swift corrective actions can limit or prevent harm to people, property, the environment, and yourself. Failure to respond correctly could be catastrophic. The Emergency Response Guidebook, or ERG, is your key resource for guidance to the safest approach and response in the initial phase of an incident, where every minute can influence the outcome. This video presentation is for responders who are either unfamiliar with the ERG or are looking to learn more about the basics of using the guidebook. This video instruction will familiarize you with the contents of the ERG as well as how to navigate its pages. It's important to note that viewing this DVD is not a substitute for personal, hands-on learning that will enable you to become proficient at accessing what you will need in an emergency. The ERG will help you interpret information about an unknown material, its potential behavior, and the appropriate actions to take in an emergency. It is your responsibility, as a first responder, to protect yourself and the public during the initial phase of an incident. Your knowledge of the guidebook before going into a hazmat incident can save lives. The Department of Transportation is responsible for the safe and secure transportation of hazmat. The ERG encapsulates all the hazard identification communication links that are required by law. 
is the responsibility of manufacturers, shippers, and transporters to use a system of labels, placards, markings, and shipping papers on all materials and transport vehicles. OSHA standards provide that the first line of hazard communication and responsibility begins with the producer of the product. All manufacturers must communicate the hazards of the product they create. Most often, this information comes in the form of a material safety data sheet. The manufacturer is obligated to ensure the safe management of the product for the duration of its existence from cradle to grave. The shipper of the product is required to provide a shipping document based on the Department of Transportation regulations, an emergency response telephone number that is monitored at all times when the hazmat is in transportation, a hazard class or division number, four digit ID number, and a shipping name. And finally, the transporter is the steward for the safe movement of the material. They are required to provide you with the proper shipping paper, as well as to ensure that the transport vehicle displays the accurate placard for the hazmat. In some cases involving international intermodal containers, an orange panel for material identification may be present with or without a placard. Your correct usage of the ERG is the final, most vital link in this interdependent framework. Before we discuss how the ERG is organized, let's give some context to the use of the ERG. Let's talk about some real possibilities that exist for you when approaching an unknown hazmat scene. In Ludwig Benner's General Hazardous Material Behavior Model, a container of material is stressed in three ways, thermally, mechanically, or chemically. When stressed, it most likely will breach and release its contents, engulfing anything in its pathway. Never underestimate the possibility of dealing with chemical reactions. In this instance, the letter P next to the ERG's guide number would have informed you that the product may polymerize if subjected to high heat or if contaminated. According to Benner's model, risk assessment must begin at a distance. When arriving at a hazmat incident, your first responsibility is to keep yourself and the public safe. Resist rushing in. Position yourself upwind, uphill, or upstream from the hazard. And stay clear of all vapors, fumes, smoke, and spills. On the day when you are called to the next hazardous materials accident, the goal is that you are ready. Understanding the content and organizational layout of the ERG is where we will begin. All the information you need on how and when to use the ERG can be found in the opening white pages, including how to use this guidebook instructions in a flowchart format. Various sections in the ERG 2016 edition have been expanded or revised, including shipping documents, tables, <coughs> placards, markings and labels, rail and road trailer ID charts, pipeline transportation, protective clothing, IED, safe standoff distances, and emergency response telephone numbers. New sections have been added to include an area to add local emergency response numbers, a table of contents, and a globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals. In the yellow and blue bordered pages, all new dangerous goods have been added that are listed in the UN recommendations on the transport of dangerous goods up to the 19th revised edition. Two new orange guides for absorbed gases were added. And in the green bordered pages, initial isolation and protective action distances in tables one and three were updated based on new toxicity data and reactivity research. A table for estimating wind speed from environmental clues was added in the how to use table three section. Anytime you look up a hazmat in the ERG, you will begin with either the yellow pages or blue pages. Those pages will guide you directly to the center of the book where the orange guides are located. The orange section is ultimately where you want to end up in the ERG. It contains the information you need in order to respond 
If you find the four-digit ID number first, from the placard or from the shipping document, then you will go to the yellow pages and look up that number numerically. The orange guide number will be in the column beside it. In this case, Orange Guide 128 will give you the information that you need. If you find the name of the material first, which can be found on package markings or on the shipping paper, then you will go to the blue pages and look up that name alphabetically to find the Orange Guide number. And again, we see it leads us to Orange Guide 128. It's important to read the full name of the material. <coughs> For example, if you were to look up arsenic, you need to know whether it is arsenic bromide, arsenic chloride, or another arsenic variation. This will keep you from going to the incorrect guide. The orange guides are the core of the ERG. In the orange guides, you will find three major areas. Potential hazards, public safety, and emergency response. Each orange guide number is for a group of materials with similar chemical and toxicological characteristics. The key to using the ERG is applying the data points we will be discussing to get you to this orange section. Once you have the proper guide for the material you are confronted with, then you have corrective actions to put into effect until qualified personnel can arrive and assist you. moments when the identification of the material is completely unknown. You could be the only responder on the scene for an extended period of time. You will need to use any and all available visual identification clues to safely approach the scene. Again, risk assessment must begin at a distance. In the very best case scenario upon arriving on an incident, you will have the shipping paper available to you with the necessary pieces of information you need to react immediately and decisively. Most often, there will be only parts of the information available, depending upon the nature of the incident. The appearance of colored smoke, a vapor cloud, or people who collapse with no apparent cause may be your very first clue to the presence of hazmat. The shape of the container can be another clue is for a long range to indicate a vehicle carrying hazmat. As a last resort, you could use the road and rail car information chart in the white pages. As you get closer, you may be able to see only the color of a placard or other markings on the vehicle. So, in cases where you can advance no further, you can still locate an orange guide for response instructions, even if you only have the vehicle shape or the color of the placard. Each advance towards the scene will add critical data points that will take you from an unknown situation towards an orange guide, which leads you to safety and corrective actions instructions. The more thoroughly you understand how to use the emergency response guidebook, the more you can significantly influence the successful outcome of an event. Your ability to assess the situation, identify the hazards, secure the scene, and begin using the ERG to inform your corrective action decisions after placing a call for assistance is imperative. If you see a placard with no words, there will be a hazard class number at the bottom. Reference the placard's page and then go to the corresponding orange guide for instructions. For a complete listing of hazard classes, refer to page 6 in the white pages. You may also occasionally see a double orange panel. The top is used on some intermodal bulk containers and is referred to as the hazard identification code, and below that is your four-digit identification number. In a rescue situation, you must always weigh and measure risk before acting. Whenever possible, use binoculars to survey the hazard. The ERG will be your tool to assess those risks before rushing into a scene. The ERG is a guidance resource to approach and secure the incident safely, identify the level of hazard, and obtain help by calling
following any incident according to your agency's protocols. In the absence of any information, placards, shipping papers, or container markings, you can always go to Guide 111, the very first guide in the orange pages. And only as a last resort, use the road and rail car information. When provided with the shipping documents from a transporter, find the product name and proceed to the blue pages in order to get to the orange guide. Remember, any knowledge the transporter may have could prove to be extremely helpful and save time. Throughout the blue and yellow pages, you'll notice many highlighted entries. These highlighting materials indicate that the material is a toxic inhalation hazard, or TIH. Once you realize you are dealing with a TIH material, the green bordered pages will provide you with an annex to Table 1, Initial Isolation and Protective Action Distances. Table 2, Water Reactive Materials that Produce Toxic Gases. And Table 3, Isolation and Evacuation Distances for 6 Common TIH Materials. When identifying the appropriate isolation zone for the nature of the TIH material you've encountered, pay close attention to notations regarding variables that influence the situation, whether it is day or night, the differences between a large and a small spill, wind direction, and estimating wind speed from environmental flues. Table 2 lists materials that produce TIH gases when spilled in water. The ramifications of quantity will greatly affect the isolation and evacuation distance guidance. Be aware that vapors may be channeled in valleys or buildings. Note also that all distances are given in meters, feet, kilometers, and miles. You should also be aware that in every orange guide under the public safety heading, you will find isolation and evacuation distances that correspond to that specific material. Know that the presence of fire in an incident involving a TIH material will possibly make toxicity factors a lower priority than fire or explosion potential. The white pages include revised information about gas pipelines and liquid pipelines, how to identify and or respond to incidents involving them. Pipelines are mostly buried, but there are above ground structures and signs indicating the presence of underground pipelines. Liquid pipelines carry crude oil, diesel fuel, and jet fuel. Gas pipelines carry natural gas. Pipeline releases can range from relatively minor leaks to catastrophic ruptures. It is important to remember that gases and liquids behave differently once they are released from a pipeline. Generally, the following could be indications of a pipeline leak or rupture. Hissing, roaring, or explosive sound. Flames appearing from the ground or water, perhaps very large flames vapor cloud, fog, or mist, dirt, debris, or water blowing out of the ground, liquids bubbling up from the ground or bubbling in water, distinctive, unusually strong odor of rotten eggs, skunk, or petroleum, discolored or dead vegetation, or discolored snow above a pipeline right-of-way, oil slick or sheen on flowing or standing water. These pages are your guide to responding correctly and safely. The notification sequence and requests for technical information beyond what's available in this guidebook should occur in the following order. Notify your dispatcher. If that's not an option, then locate and call the telephone number listed on the shipping documents. If you can't obtain the shipping documents, then contact the appropriate emergency response organization listed on the inside back cover of the ERG. Keep in mind also that the white pages provide additional resource information on protective clothing, fire and spill control, criminal terrorist use, improvised explosive devices, safe standoff distances, chemical, biological, and radiological agents, and a glossary of terminology where you can find definitions of terms, like previously mentioned polymerization. And finally, on the back inside cover, the emergency response telephone number listing. Let's review. Resist rushing in. Position yourself upwind, uphill, or <coughs> upstream from the hazard, and stay clear of all vapors, fumes, smoke, and spills. When arriving at the scene of an incident, 
you were expected to recognize the presence of hazmat. Any efforts made to rescue persons, property, or the environment must be weighed against the possibility that you could become part of the problem. Without entering the immediate hazard area, isolate and secure the area. Protect yourself and the public. And above all, do not walk into or touch spilled material. Call for the assistance of trained personnel as soon as conditions permit. Previously, we referenced Guide 111 when you're unable to discern a starting point. A major exception to this is when you suspect or know that explosives are involved. In those cases, immediately reference Guide 112. If an ID number or name of material cannot be found, but a placard is in sight, find the table of placards in the front white pages, match the placard, and use the orange guide number indicated. Then, go to that orange guide and read the response instructions carefully. If you find the shipping paper first, you will locate the name of the product in the appropriate area. The blue pages are alphabetical by product name. Directly beside the name will be your orange guide number. If the placard is visible and you can locate the ID number in the center, then go to the numerical listing in the yellow pages. Reference the appropriate orange guide number that the material has highlighted. The orange guide and the green pages will inform you on protective actions due to the TIH hazard. In the case of a double orange panel, remember that the top number is the hazard identification code, which identifies the hazard class of the material. And the bottom number is your four-digit identification number. When a single orange panel is present, it will contain the four-digit identification number. The Emergency Response Guidebook is designed for you, the emergency responder. It is one of your most powerful resources to protect and save lives when called to an event involving hazmat. How you react in the first few minutes of an incident can set the stage for the entire outcome of the event, including the risk factors to yourself, the victims who need your aid, and the surrounding public. If used effectively, the ERG will help you quickly interpret the hazard information and give you corrective action steps to influence a successful outcome. Fortunately, our nation has a hazard communication framework designed to support you when you are the first to arrive on a hazmat incident. By understanding the system of placards, labels, and shipping papers, and their role in the emergency response guidebook, you can make a successful outcome a reality.
comma, ammonia. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so Don't call me. 
Contact Susie at the city. She's going to have to do everything on her side of things. So that's all you really need to know. Is we're going to send you to Berlin. They're going to do all their testing and stuff, and then a workman's comp claim or exposure is going to be opened up. That's really it. But we'll follow you with this. So Med One should take care of this. Med One of the day should take care of this. Just know we need to know ASAP when you get exposed. All right. Things can be done shortly after it, but you know, don't wait two weeks and go, oh, by the way, I was pulled two weeks. Now have a growth yeah. I now can't move my face. What's that? What is a massive mess, too, for you when you got pulled? Oh, yeah. uh, not so much. I didn't get poked. I got um, blood and vomit in my face and mouth. Uh, on my everywhere. I, I, was, I was covered. <laughs> um, so we loaded the guy on the helicopter and I went, hey Evan, <laughs> I need to go to Berlin. And he went, I got exposed. Yeah, you do. And Dr. Fro was pretty straightforward. I really exposed myself. 